Okay, welcome Shipra ma'am, welcome Amrita ma'am, and I'm really thankful to both of you for sparing your very crucial time for me today for this interaction. Thank yes. you so much, Dr. Vijay. Yeah, thank you. It's our pleasure. Okay, so ma'am, you both represent a very good initiative of uh, Government of India, and uh, that is the Delhi Research Implementation and Innovation uh, Initiative. So we'll be knowing more about that. Uh, so, ma'am, this uh, initiative, uh, this initiative is taken on behalf of Principal Scientific Advisor uh, to Government of India, and this initiative, which I uh, studied and I went through, this initiative is one of the very, very, uh, I'll say, innovative thing, and this is much required at the time when we are trying to plug the industry academia gap, and we want our youngsters. Uh, to go for entrepreneurial domains. When we talk about Make in India and Atam Nirbhar Bharat, this particular initiative has come at a right, very right appropriate time. So I'm very sure, ma'am, the inputs which will come from you will be very, very helpful to all the viewers. Uh, largely, uh, the viewers on my channel are those technocrats who are looking for such opportunities where they can explore the technical domains for entrepreneurial things. So I'm very sure the inputs which are going to come from you are going to be very, very helpful to them. So uh, my first, uh, I have collected some uh, uh, interaction points, ma'am. I have uh, some questionnaire with me and I'll be going one by one to both of you for that. So uh, my first question to Shipra, ma'am, is related to DRIVE only, the acronym D-R-I-I-V, that stands for Daily Research Implementation and Innovation. So I want you to tell all of us here, what is this initiative all about? So uh, thank you, Dr. Vijayendra, for this opportunity. So uh, the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India uh, has initiated the science and technology clusters across the country. There are six of them. Uh, Drive is one. Uh, with a view to bring together industry, academia, and government bodies and take innovation from lab to market. Okay. The concept of the science and technology clusters it, it, uh, is not new, although in India it was introduced uh, just over a year ago. Uh, but in the West, it has been proven over the years, more than 30, 40 years. And when we think of a, a, you know, a cluster, Silicon Valley comes to mind. Okay. Right? So although that's completely off the chart uh, because it's so huge, uh, there are other smaller clusters uh, in U.S., as well and across Europe, where uh, they have played a crucial role in transforming the uh, you know, social and economic landscape of the region. The concept of these clusters is basically wherever there is clustering or aggregation of any kind of industry that can bring about a transformative change in the region. So here, the Delhi cluster, because uh, Delhi is home to a number of premier institutes of the country. We have IIT Delhi, we have AIMS, we have, uh, you know, government, uh, state laboratories, uh, etc. Also, it's the uh, political capital of India. So we have access to all the ministries, uh, you know, the policymakers. Yes. Furthermore, in Gurgaon, which is the millennial city, it's the hub of corporate offices, yes. right? So it's an ideal location or ideal hotspot to encourage all these, you know, different constituencies to come together mm -hmm. to solve problems that have been plaguing India for a long time using science and technology. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, ma'am, uh, what I know is like uh, presently uh, under this uh, particular drive initiative, we have six science and technology clusters. So uh, that is near Delhi NCR region. So I want to know uh, from you, what is the catchment area of drive? Is it only NCR region or we have some broad catchment area? Also? So firstly, the six clusters that have been seeded are across the country. Okay. Right. So uh, for example, other clusters include Pune cluster, Hyderabad, Bangalore, mm -hmm. Bhubaneswar, and Jodhpur. These right. are the other cities where the clusters have been seeded. Okay. Now the nomenclature of the clusters has been kept based on the city in which the cluster has been seeded. Right. In terms, in terms of the jurisdiction or the operational remit, uh, it's national level or even international partnerships. Right. The 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 uh, concept of clustering is that if it's focused around a region, okay. then it becomes easier to interact and work together and mobilize, uh, you know, certain projects which would otherwise be difficult to uh, maneuver 
if the geographical distances are too huge. So that is the only uh, you know, practical constraint. Otherwise, in terms of remits, there are no geographical boundaries as such. And we work on thematic areas with other clusters as well and uh, with corporates or startups from anywhere in the country. Ma'am, I was going through uh, this entire uh, program of drive and I, I, did, I found that uh, you are working on eight different verticals, uh, uh, which you just mentioned as thematic areas. So can you please um, yeah, make us aware about these thematic areas? And I would like you to tell us uh, like on what criteria, on what basis you have identified uh, this huge uh, research and uh, innovation domain into these eight verticals. So what these eight verticals are and uh, what is the significance? Why these eight only? And what do we want to attain by putting all the research domains into these eight verticals? Okay. A very good question. So again, these thematic areas are arising from alignment with the national missions, okay. right? Because basically all the resource of the resources of the country should be focused on addressing what is national priority. Right. So our missions are or our uh, thematic areas are all aligned with national missions and primarily with the sustainability components or sustainability aspects of the mission. Right. So we deal with, uh, you know, waste to wealth, okay. right, which, which started as a solid waste management. And because of the technological intervention and because of the wealth being created, now the vertical has also led to a completely, uh, you know, new vertical called uh, you know, sustainable right. energy. Mm -hmm. Then water security, water is scarce throughout the country and particularly North India really battles with the water problem, uh, particularly in the summer months. Mm -hmm. Then we have air pollution. Mm -hmm. So again, winter months are upon us and air pollution is a huge problem. So we are doing a lot of work, including uh, a pilot we are going to initiate, which I'll you know, talk about it later. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, so in addition to these sustainability initiatives, we are looking at some, you know, cutting edge uh, technological uh, interventions, uh, for example, e-mobility. So again, it's a national mission, you know, wanting to switch from fossil fuel to electric vehicles and other alternative sources of energy for mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have, uh, you know, uh, applications of AI ML in the healthcare sector. Uh, with the vision of making healthcare affordable and timely healthcare accessible to the remote corners of the country, as well as uh, you know becoming decision making about it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have uh, effective education, okay. uh, where uh, we work uh, with our team uh, towards the implement implementation of NEP twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the areas where we focus on. Okay. Ma'am, these eight thematic areas which you have just now mentioned, they are one of the very, very, I think, uh, high probability areas where if somebody wants to work in and get into entrepreneurship, the probability of success may be very, very high. And they are the latest, uh, uh, you know, domains of technology where technology solutions can provide the solution to the problem of the society also. Ma'am, you also call these things as market-ready solutions. That is uh, how we... Uh, tell about these particular areas. So I want to know through you, uh, what do we mean by when we say market ready solution? Do we talk something like uh, how easy commercialization of the research on these thematic area is? Or what do we mean when we say market ready solutions in these areas? So I think we have to take a huge step back in order to understand the overall landscape and where we are coming from. So historically, uh, till date, Investment in R&D in India is very, very disappointing. It's low, you know, lower than uh, 1%, uh, whereas the international average is around 5%, right? Mm -hmm. So systematically, there has been a huge gap in terms of putting time and money and effort into research. Into mm -hmm. okay. And that gap cannot be plugged mm -hmm. overnight. That's true. Right. Now, the state of research or, you know, the state of, uh, you know, things coming out of research institutes as of now, because of the low level of investments in this area, right. is such that it still requires a lot of industrial support and handholding, understanding of the market, 
um, a lot of support in terms of commercialization mm -hmm. right before it's ready to be handed over uh, you know either as technology transfer to a corporate or as you know a startup okay uh, that starts taking uh, that starts making money right so most of the solutions coming out uh, of the cluster are low trl level and another reason for this is you know so be it public or private even public funding uh, most of the you know public funding bodies are such that they provide grants at low trl level technologies right, right? so getting something funded as a seed project or trl one to two project to uh, bring it to a trl four okay right mm -hmm. is a lot easier through public grants, mm -hmm. right? Or even there are some private grants. Right. Uh, then there are a large, uh, you know, large providers of funding, both in the public space, like, you know, Technology Develop Development Board, as well as in the private space, like the VCs, etc. that would invest in post-commercialization technologies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there exists a huge gap between TRL4 Mm -hmm. to TRL 8, mm -hmm. where technologies can be, you know, beyond the lab scale, beyond the pilot scale, they can be brought to a point where they would be of any commercial interest to anyone. Mm -hmm. Right? This is the basic thing. Mm -hmm. When we say market ready, so we have a plethora of technologies. So we have 50 plus institutes within our cluster. We have n number of technologies within the cluster. Right. But when we say market ready solutions, we are talking about close to TRL level eight, mm -hmm. where just a little bit of tweak here and there and partnership with corporates mm -hmm. can, uh, you know, make these technologies uh, market ready okay. or commercializable. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So my my next question, uh, maybe that is, I think uh, Dr. Amrita is more appropriate to answer that particular question. Uh, uh, Dr. Amrita, you are head techni technology licensing. And uh, my next question is related to industry academia interaction only. So what I'm trying to understand is like uh, industries are working in different ecosystem and uh, academic institutes work in different uh, ecosystem. Normally, industry people feel like having solution from uh, academic uh, institutes and uh, academic institutes are very, very rich in terms of manpower, uh, very good research were going on, very good research labs also going on. But somewhere there's a gap, gap in the sense that uh, academia uh, feel that uh, uh, industries are not approaching them with the uh, proper projects and appropriate projects and industries people feel that the research goes at particular pace and we may require solution immediately and i believe this driiv initiative is trying to plug that particular gap and licensing is something which is very very crucial component in this entire initiative so dr amrita i would like to know through you how difficult uh, is this to bring industry and academic institutes at one platform and then, uh, you know, work in that particular direction. Yeah, so as you have rightly uh, put out, it's we are actually the platform which uh, we are trying to collate the industry and academia relationship, right? So, uh, of course, industries have their specific problems, problem statements that they want to solve. And academ in academia, you know, researchers go on doing research, publish papers, and then they just, you know, they those high, matlab, high impact research just stops there. There is no, you know, conduit of implementing that high, uh, extremely uh, important or relevant findings on field. So that's where we come to play. So as per industrial requirement, we reach out within our huge community of 50 plus stakeholders that, uh, you know, comprise of Institute of Eminence, for example, IITD, IIITD, AIMS, JNU and all. So there is no dark of technology as well as research uh, activities, right? So we, as per industrial requirement, we reach out, we scout for the relevant technology we look into the technology readiness level of those, uh, you know, uh, those technologies, and then 
uh, it's a two way traffic so sometimes queries come from um, uh, industries and then we reach out to the academy as per their query sometimes we reach out to academia then we uh, understand what they have and how those uh, research uh, uh, the research work can be brought how those work can be uh, taken from lab to market mm -hmm. that will be used as uh, you know uh, betterment for the nation to uh, perfectly align with the national mission mm -hmm. then we approach to ma'am and through the to our platform to mm -hmm. uh, relevant industry and then we sit together and come to a common uh, agreement on. So, you know, it's ju just not industries are very much, you know, they are all, uh, they are interested in supporting research in the sustainability field mm. also. It's not that they are only looking for market ready solutions, mm. right? Because somehow they feel, for example, an industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry, they kind of feel responsible for polluting the environment right so they would like to give something back to the environment by supporting some some sustainable uh, project on the sustainability field yes. so they uh, through us they come to know what we can offer what academia can offer at the r d level right. as well as what is there in store in the academia with high tier level so this is how it is work yes. and we are doing our bit and it's, uh, you know, let's see, we are uh, succeeding. It takes time because, you know, uh, spreading the word takes time. Mm, uh, right. You know, we need, uh, although our uh, we are attracting attention from all kinds of target audience, still we need further outreach to mm. make people aware, aware of the fact that a platform like this, like us, exists, mm. where they can come. And we can facilitate this collaboration. Okay. So, uh, ma'am, uh, my next question is, ma'am, Shipper, ma'am, for you. Uh, there are so many industry-ready solutions which are there on our platform uh, of Drive. And uh, I, I, I believe that can be wonderful if uh, that eventually helps the main mission of the government, uh, which was, uh, you know, conceived by our Honorable Prime Minister during COVID, that we want to become self-reliant, Atm Nirbar Bharat. And uh, if you want to become self-reliant, ma'am, we need hundreds of uh, young entrepreneurs who can work on some technologies and provide the solution, and in turn, also provide the employment to youngsters. My question to you, ma'am, is like these market-ready solutions, which are there on your portal, which are there on your platform. Can some budding entrepreneur conceive an uh, idea about that and can take that particular idea further and can create some kind of, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurial venture for himself? If that's so, then how he or she can proceed forward? Absolutely. Um, so in some of our themes already, we are working with a number of startups, for example, in the space of e-mobility. We are working with startups, uh, you know, across the range uh, mm -hmm. in the space of, uh, you know, developing charging infrastructure in the space of you know business model for swapping stations mm -hmm. in the space of you know developing the app that can you know manage the battery systems uh, mm -hmm. and all of that so and also you know looking at battery chemistry but uh, that is not enough so if i again you know take a look at uh, you know marrying technology mm -hmm. to actual use cases that solve the nation's problem at scale, there is much more that is required than simply developing the technology, right? For example, if I take the case of, you know, e-waste management, right. correct? Mm -hmm. So a number of technologies exist within the cluster mm -hmm. that can, uh, you know, extract metal from uh, e-waste and make into valuable products as well, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what is not happening at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. There is firstly, uh, you know, in the public consciousness, mm -hmm. there is not enough awareness mm -hmm. that e-waste is a big problem. It right. causes huge environmental problem, right? Mm -hmm. Both in terms of causing air pollution where, uh, you know, waste is burned publicly mm -hmm. by the unorganized sector. Right. And then also in terms of leachate, where, you know, old batteries, etc. are disposed of, and they end up in landfill. Right. 
Right. And then there's a you know problem of heavy metals leaching into soil and going into water. Right. right. So one is the lack of public awareness. Then there is complete absence of a value chain. Yeah. Uh, for instance, you know, 90% of the e-way sector is being handled informally, right? So in the absence of a more widespread, there exists a formal sector, uh, but in the absence of a more widespread formal se sector, there is no value chain mm -hmm. that can go and collect, you know, e-waste from households, right, from societies, and then process it properly so that that waste is still connect, you know, uh, converted into valuable products. For example, you know, plastic of the e-waste can be e converted into fuel. The uh, metals can be extracted and resold in the market for value. Uh, if you compare it with newspapers, for example, and cardboards, you will see that in all households, right? Mm -hmm. Newspapers are preserved and they're sold to raddiwalas, right? They're not just discarded in the bins. Right. Cardboards are sold and stocked up because cardboards, you know, have a you know huge market value because they're used in producing these uh, boards, uh, sorry, sorry, wood boards, right? Mm -hmm. Likewise, we need a model where e-waste, so again, e-waste, uh, you know, need, although it has value, so for example, your laptop, right? Mm -hmm. So you do associate some value, but you don't know how much value uh, it will have when it's gone to waste right so some kind of financial incentive or financial model needs to be developed uh, to uh, kind of incentivize citizens for a more responsible handling of the waste right and also mobilize or create a value proposition or business proposition for someone mm -hmm. to organize the uh, you know value chain for proper collection mm -hmm. proper disposing and proper recycling of it so that it the valuable products actually get back into the in, uh, industry and a circular economy is created, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is one example of circular economy, uh, you know, creating waste. There are multiple other, you know, stories which can be picked up right. and young entrepreneurs can create business models around that. So this is where we need young blood, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with passion to think, innovative, uh, you know, innovatively, understand what other technological solutions we have for existing, uh, you know, problems and find out a way of you know successfully commercially solving those problems wonderful so my next uh, point was related to this only ma'am circular economy which you just now mentioned so uh, ma'am normally uh, there is one criticism of academic research normally which comes into observation and that is commercialization of uh, their research work in the form of uh, efficacious patents commercialized patents and all so I want to, uh, uh, you know, ma'am, ask about your experience in this field. Uh, how effective do you think our commercialization uh, aspect is related to our academic interest, academic research, which is going on in our premium institutes? So I did not understand the criticism part of it. So what aspect of it is criticized? Yeah, so what I mean to say that was, ma'am, we do wonderful research, but when it comes to the global level comparison of uh, uh, commercially viable patenting or research in India. So that is where India as of now at in the level of global competitive index, we stand little low actually, because our research is wonderfully good. Research papers are also there, but commercial viability part of that is uh, criticized that whether we can convert that into some kind of effective commercial model and we can sell that particular research. So, uh, Dr. Vijayendra, if you, uh, you know, refer to my previous point I made at the start of this uh, conversation, uh, less than 1% investment in science and technology versus 5% that is globally there, right? It's a huge difference, a huge difference. right? And if we don't invest, we don't expect to get more commercially viable products because if you look at the journey of how the product becomes commercially viable, right? First, the uh, you know, product has to be the research, R&D has to be done in the lab, yes. right? Then that needs to be tested at pilot scale, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Then that the pilot needs to be tested at pre-commercial stage, you know, this pilot needs to be scaled up, right? Yeah. After the pre-commercial, you know, scale, then it needs to have the entire, you know, customer set up and all of that, right? Yeah. Now, reaching from the lab scale to the end where you have the final stage, where you have all the customers, firstly, you need to put in a lot of time and effort, mm -hmm. right? Which requires fuel, which requires money. You need to have a kind of 
collaborations with multiple other stakeholders and parties, which again requires a different kind of skill, a different kind of support system, right, and more money, then it requires, you know, interaction with corporates at that level, because again, if you look at the mindset of corporates in India, right, mm -hmm. uh, the mindset is only a kind of firefighting. So focus on the problems that face you today, or that faced you yesterday, basically, right? Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no uh, kind of mindset in looking five years down the line, right? And solving for five years down the line. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, Indian arms of the corporates that are global, that are, you know, multinational companies elsewhere in the company where the headquarters are, a huge amount of R&D, et cetera, would be going on. Mm -hmm. But the Indian arms would still be just purely focused on Indian business, right? Yes. So that is where, you know, liaison with uh, corporates become very, very difficult where the co-creation model does not exist. Right. There are some, uh, you know, specific sectors, for example, e-mobility, where everybody in India, uh, you know, all OEMs in India realize, okay, so they have to do something on e-mobility. Nobody has the, you know, expertise, technical expertise, and everybody is kind of frantically looking for technological partners and solutions to acquire that expertise because they see the market growing very quickly. And if they don't move fast, then they're going to lose out, right? But this kind of, uh, you know, behavior or reaction is unique to e-mobility sector in India. Yeah. If you look at any other sector, mm -hmm. there is no urgency in terms of inventing yes. for next five years. Mm -hmm. That's where the gap is. And that mentality needs to change. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully explained, ma'am. And you rightly said that uh, we need to invest more percentage of our uh, overall GDP on uh, education and research that is required, required if we want to come to the global level. Ma'am, I want you to also share uh, some of your success stories. And... Uh, I want to bring uh, your uh, attention to one of the such success story of drive ma'am, and that is to convert hydrogen using sunlight. So uh, that is uh, that this technology is mentioned on your website, and this is one of the very uh, relevant technology for uh, present uh, time when we want to shift over from fossil fuel based uh, uh, energy domains to renewable energy domains. So I, I want to ask you about uh, this particular success story, ma'am, and also whether this technology has been commercialized. So maybe first part of the question, I would invite Dr. Amrita to take, uh, if she's still there. Yes. Yeah, sure. So uh, as for the technology, uh, the scientist is working on a technique called photocatalysis. So as the name goes, it is a sunlight mediated catalytic reaction, which gives rise to hydrogen, right? So it's very simple chemistry. So where the innovation uh, comes or the novelty of the research lies in the fact that this uh, scientist was able to introduce a very novel uh, and uh, extremely economically feasible catalyst. Okay, uh, um, basically a nano product which is easily available and uh, extremely cheap to get. Mm -hmm. okay. And they have made, you know, it's basically carbon nitride nanotubes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what they are doing is they are, uh, as part of the prototype, they are making a platform of uh, several meters squares. And then they are coating the platform with this uh, carbon nitride nano product. Okay. Then they uh, then they maintain a continuous air flow, uh, sorry, water flow uh, on the uh, chamber, and it is irradiated to sunlight, and then hydrogen is produced uh, through photocatalysis. Okay, so uh, they have measured to this process, they can almost produce 780 ml of uh, hydrogen uh, in eight hours, which is, you know, really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So this is the, uh, and now I think this project uh, was also highlighted on the DST website because it was a DST uh, funded initiative. And now the prototypic part is completed and uh, the inventor is looking for, you know, scaling it up, uh, scaling the prototype up. And also he is 
uh, you know, uh, doing more research on how to, you know, store the hydrogen and because, you know, there, there's a, a huge safety issue lies with it, it's extremely flammable and all. So they are trying to bottle it in type four canisters. Okay. And then, uh, you know, all the relevant researchers, researches are going on in that uh, direction. Okay, so I, I think uh, Dr. Amrita has answered more or less this particular question. And uh, my next my next uh, couple of points of discussion, ma'am, are, are related to the funding responsibilities uh, under DRIVE. So uh, uh, as per my understanding, DRIVE is also a body which is funding the research proposals uh, which are uh, given to uh, the platform, which are given to DRIVE. So I want to ask you, ma'am, on the website of DRIVE, there are so many R&D proposals, research proposals. So uh, what are the criteria? How uh, uh, DRIVE identifies which research proposals are to be given funding? And uh, how uh, are the fundings arranged? I mean, what is the source of funding for such proposals? So firstly, DRIVE itself is not a funding agency, okay. right? What we do is, again, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the objective of DRIVE is to attract private capital Okay. towards research and innovation, right? So uh, DRIVE sees itself playing the role of plugging this one to 5% gap. Okay. Right? So as of now, uh, our major source of funding, so uh, it started with seed funding from the TSA office, but in terms of attracting capital from a uh, private community, CSR is the major source, okay. CSR capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2021, uh, the rules, the CSR rules were changed mm -hmm. to allow uh, research and investment, particularly from premier institutes such as IIT Delhi and all the members of Drive Cluster, mm -hmm. to be recognized as CSR activity as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are reaching out to CSR arms of large corporates mm -hmm. for funding the research work. Mm -hmm. Now, again, the biggest criteria for, uh, you know, taking on these projects is alignment with our thematic area, okay. right? Yeah. How well they align with the thematic area, what problem are they solving, how effectively they are solving, mm -hmm. and how relevant is the technology and how robust is the technology. Mm -hmm. so, so these are the, you know, things that we look at. Okay, so ma'am, uh, 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 I want to ask you related to the self-sustaining part of this entire initiative of DRIVE. I want to ask you, ma'am, whether we have become self-sustainable uh, self to some extent in DRIVE or and when do we, uh, uh, you know, look forward to become totally self-sustainable in our initiatives? Because I, what I presume right now is like we may be getting some kind of uh, uh, sustainability from uh, different uh, uh, corners or different departments or maybe government. So when do we want to become totally self-sustainable in all our activities uh, under the umbrella of DRIVE? So uh, if you want to understand the models and on which the clusters work, if you study the models of the West okay. and look how clusters evolve, right? Uh, the cluster, the minimum time that any cluster took in the West to become self-sustainable was 10 years, Okay. right? Mm -hmm. Even after 10 years, uh, they needed to have a public private model mm -hmm. for funding, mm -hmm. right? So, and for the first 10 years, there has a minimum of 10 years. Some clusters have taken much longer than mm -hmm. that, right? Some clusters are still not, uh, you know, self-sustainable after, you know, 20, 30 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we talk of you know self sustain you know self sustainability, we what we need to bear in mind is that there is a humongous task that needs to be achieved by the cluster, right? And just for recounting that task, right? Plugging this gap from one percent to five percent, right? For seventy five years, it has been sub one percent. Overnight, it can't be expected to be five percent, right? Changing the mindset of people, both in the researcher community where the researcher community so far has been uh, kind of complacent with uh, doing fantastic research, getting the patterns, getting the papers and be happy with it, right? And not worry about implementation. To the corporate community as well, where immediate focus is on firefighting and not, you know, not on a five-year horizon uh, in terms of cutting edge technology development, right? 
In terms of collaborative efforts, so people in India are very good at working individually, mm -hmm. right? We are still not a country that harbors the culture of collaboration, so mm -hmm. particularly in the academic circles, because mm -hmm. our uh, academia thrives on competition. So we have competitive exams. Mm -hmm. That culture remains, right? Mm -hmm. right? So there are huge shifts, attitudinal shifts that need to be brought about, mm -hmm. right? Now, in doing that, of course, you know, one would expect, you know, it would take time. Mm -hmm. Plus, there needs to be government involvement as well, not in terms of the central government, but in terms of the local government, where these projects, especially when we're focusing on sustainability, none of the sustainability projects can be completed without involvement of the local governments. For example, we are going to do an air pollution pilot soon, and I will talk more about it later. That, you know, involves engagement of, you know, all the local bodies that are there in the Delhi NCR region. Mm -hmm. So making those kind of, you know, creating platforms and relationships and collaborations mm -hmm. where everybody works in silos, even within the government setups, mm -hmm. right? It will take time. It will not happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Despite that, in the past one year, we have been able to mobilize 10 crore of rupees into R&D space. Okay. Mostly from other public bodies via public grants and other, uh, you know, local governments, etc., which is the non-PSA money, mm -hmm. and some from the corporates as well. But it will take a huge time. What I see in the next three to five years, we should be able to, uh, you know, attract significant amount of money to go into research and sustainability initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the official running of these clusters there would need to be continued support, uh, you know, operational support from the government. Ma'am, what I understand is like uh, this drive initiative is getting the funding largely from national bodies and you also mentioned about corporate social responsibility part of maybe private sector industries and maybe public sector industries also. Uh, I want to ask you, ma'am, do we expect uh, some kind of international or global funding also in future because there are so many such bodies which are interested to help Indian industries also. So do we look for that also, ma'am, in future? As you just yes, mentioned. Of course. Yes, uh, yeah. I mean, some of our projects are being funded by international bodies and international philanthropic organizations, okay. and that will continue to be the case. Okay, uh, ma'am, this uh, daily research implementation and innovation, uh, this uh, umbrella, uh, presently 50 plus uh, organizations are uh, working under this umbrella, which what I understand. But India is a very uh, broad country and different regions have their, got their own problems, their own issues, different state governments and uh, people in uh, different states have their own issues and any research should try to solve the problems of the local people over there. So do we uh, uh, plan and do we have this kind of vision ma'am, to expand uh, to do, uh, each nook and corner of the country and you know put uh, people on board, different institutes on board uh, and so that research becomes more uh, uh, you know, oriented towards the providing the solution to the problems of the local people over there. Yeah, this is this is the whole idea, Dr. Vijayantan, which is why you know six clusters have been set up uh, initially to test, and again, you know, it will take some time to test out, you know, which clusters are working, how, and what model suits them, right? And which is why, because as you have now seen that, you know. Uh, each cluster needs to engage with so many different types of stakeholders, right? So there is a limitation of capacity also, mm -hmm. right? Which is why, uh, you know, the, the whole concept of clustering works. So there, there are clusters, you know, across various regions of the country, which can handle their own regional space, That's right? True. But if a solution comes out of a cluster that can be scaled up nationally, that is being done and that is being looked at. For example, I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, public mo mobility uh, that came out from a cluster. So mm -hmm. one of the researchers developed, uh, you know, this app on mobility, mm -hmm. which will have public data, which will look at public transportation and make it easier for people to, uh, you know, use public transport so like e-ticketing would be there on the app then if they're using buses information on the arrival time of the buses you know how late they are you're know, traveling where, where the stops would be you so typical kind of service that you get from a bus app in the west would be provided to you here right now they success it was called the charter app 
And the Charter app was successfully adopted by the Delhi government. Now they've branded it as one app and they're trying to build more features on it, but it is now being used and that is deployed for all uh, you know, Delhi buses, right? After successful deployment, now this solution is being showcased to other states as well. And conversations are rife on the adoption by other states as well. So there are several such solutions where technologies, you know, that are scalable and can be applied at national level will be done. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, ma'am, I have come uh, to almost an end of this wonderful session with the both of you. But my last two questions, uh, one each for um, uh, uh, you, ma'am, Shibra, ma'am, and uh, Dr. Amrita. So I'll go first with Dr. Amrita. And I'll ask the challenges you have faced, ma'am, in licensing activities. This is one of the very, very, I'll say, ticklish activity uh, to bring uh, industries close to academia and get the people together, you know, put them together on a platform and solve the questions. So what challenges you have faced so far in this entire journey? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you bring uh, an innovation from a lab to market, so the innovation has been developed in lab scale and uh, the proof of concept has been uh, validated in lab scale, right? So that lab scale is not a huge scale. But uh, as soon as you uh, venture out to a corporate, the first thing that they will look at will be, uh, so seven, uh, for, I'll, I'll just take an example of this hydrogen production, right? Yes. So 760 ml of uh, hydrogen in eight hours, we do, Matlab, we make more. Okay. So then just give me one reason why we should go for it. They don't ask it, but mm -hmm. that's what they think. So okay. we already have scaled up, techno scaled up technologies existing with us. So mm -hmm. why, what's so special? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, making them understand the essence and novelty of research that's been carried out in the premier institution, mm -hmm. I, to me, is a challenge, mm -hmm. you know, because they come with a preconceived notion that mm -hmm. what is done in lab stays in lab and it ends in after publishing research papers, right? Yes, yes. So that that, that so mindset needs to be changed yes. and how will it change as ma'am rightly mentioned uh, but, but you know we need more investment right basic mm -hmm. research is always the fundamental of mm -hmm. any research activities and it should be there mm -hmm. but uh, taking this but uh, starting with basic research and then making it implementable on ground that's the challenge and then make the you know the uh, commercializable body understand and realize the novelty of the research is the second mm -hmm. second challenge that we face all the time <laughs> ma'am can correct me <laughs> <laughs> that is true ma'am <laughs> that is true and your job is like that only i can understand the <laughs> challenges changing the mindset as ma'am ma mentioned it is really mm -hmm. it will take time yes. so uh, my last question is to uh, madam shipra Ma'am, uh, any wonderful idea uh, needs a lot of, uh, uh, you know, conviction and a lot of courage and a lot of commitments to make it successfully implemented. You need to uh, do a lot of hardships for that. You are the person on the driver's seat. You are MD, you are CEO of this drive initiative. I can understand the kind of tremendous pressure on you for making this entire thing quite successful. And India as a country developing nation, always we lack resources we need to uh, very optimally utilize all these resources uh, we are a huge country and still uh, we have to grow a lot uh, so ma'am I, I understand there will be a lot of pressure on you so i want to ask you the challenges you have faced so far and uh, uh, how do you see this entire thing getting successfully implemented in future okay uh, dr vijendra before i forget and before i answer your question let me come back to the air pollution pilot uh, that we are going to do because it's very very important okay so so let's make space uh, for that so uh, you know in terms of uh, as i said one of the key objectives of drive is to be a local solution provider yes right and the most pressing problem that's upon us uh, you know, in Delhi and CR region now is problem of air pollution. It starts in the winter season yes. and, uh, you know, the pollutant, the PM levels are so high that even the monitoring machines fail, right? It goes completely off scale. Okay. 
Right. So this year we are planning uh, with Delhi government in Delhi and GMDA in Gurgaon okay. to launch a pilot uh, spanning November, beginning November to end February, okay. where it will be a three-pronged approach. Okay. One will be an awareness drive, awareness and community engagement drive. Mm -hmm. Second would be science and technology intervention. Okay. And third would be CEO roundtables and workshops. Okay. Right. So now uh, within the first one, a number of these drives have already been happening in silos, but, but again, true to the purpose of drive, which is creating an ecosystem. We are trying to consolidate. We have partnered with Lung Care Foundation. We've part partnered with a number of, of NGOs, for example, uh, you know, IPS Foundation, uh, et cetera. We have our own uh, effective education team that has reached uh, schools and colleges. Mm -hmm. So through these partnerships, in terms of community engagement, we are targeting four communities. Mm -hmm. The farmer community uh, to restrict the burning of uh, uh, you know, parali. The doctor community that will uh, you know, educate both the farmers as well as the other communities. What is the impact of these harmful pollutants on the, not only on the lungs, but the entire body? Mm -hmm. you know, uh, of, of the human system. Mm -hmm. Then uh, through schools and colleges, uh, you know, we mobilize, uh, you know, uh, students, not just, you know, to limit the awareness right to their own, uh, you know, schools and, uh, you know, classrooms, mm -hmm. but to reach out to communities like RWAs, the local RWAs, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, uh, you know, urban slums, because even now, although, you know, when we think of air pollution, the first thing that comes to our mind is Diwadi crackers, right? But scientifically, scientifically, most of the pollution mm -hmm. is caused by non-cracker incidents, right? You mean like Parali burning, mm -hmm. burning is the major cause. Then even, you know, angitis okay. that are still used in urban slums. When you talk of, when you think of angiti, we think that, you know, they happen only in villages. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. Urban slums, are, you know, continued uh, usage of angitis is there. Mm -hmm. So all these, you know, activities combined, if, you know, the student crowd can be mobilized mm -hmm. to reach out to these communities and spread awareness uh, about the initiatives that are going on. Mm -hmm. That will be very, very effective, right? Mm -hmm. Second, in terms of science and technology intervention, mm -hmm. so we have a number of products mm -hmm. from researcher community, from the startup community, mm -hmm. where they not just monitor the PM levels, but there are solutions that bring down the PM levels mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. right? So there are various machines, uh, you know, and uh, various filters uh, that you know, not just, you know, static, but also dynamic that can be attached to vehicles. And when the vehicles move around, they can clean the air as they're moving. There are various misting solutions, right? So you can install misting solutions, uh, you know, along the sides of the roads or as speed breakers. So, you know, they can be activated when a vehicle passes through them. So these kind of solutions need to be tested, mm -hmm. you know, with the assistance of the, you know, uh, local governments. Mm -hmm. And then scaled up, depending on their success rate, scaled up to effectively tackle the air pollution problem so that every year, you know, we don't have to suffer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, what I wanted to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Ma'am, in this NCR region, if we uh, solve this air pollution, that will be wonderful because uh, in NCR region is a huge population and we know there's so many health, uh, you know, problems associated with this. That will be wonderful, ma'am. And I wish you all the very best for this wonderful plan, which uh, you are going to execute, ma'am, next couple of months. And wish you get success in this plan. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Ma my last question to you was uh, the challenges, ma'am, you have faced. That I still come back to that question. <laughs> so I can think... avoid that. And uh, I know you, you must be a pers person under a lot of uh, such uh, pressure and challenges from all sides. Still, I want some of the challenges you uh, please share with us. No, absolutely. So, you know, as, as you now understand, you know, creating the cluster and executing upon the vision of the cluster, which is, you know, create a shared ecosystem in the first place to become a local solution provider on top of that and then become nationally competitive. It's a huge ask. Okay. Correct. And given where we are right now, you know, absence of uh, R&D investment, absence of collaboration, absence of a long term vision in terms of, you know, what technological ambitions should be, right? All these kind of, you know, not just uh, require technological solutions, they require huge mindset and soft skills to orchestrate, right?
Right. So right. obviously that's that you know tremendously challenging. Then breaking through silos, right? Be it within the research community, be it between research community and local government, be it between uh, you know research community and corporates, be it you know bringing all of them together. It's a very, very challenging task, working with different kinds of stakeholders. But then, uh, you know, so I love challenges. And yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. so, so what I understood, ma'am, like it was a wonderful session with you. What I understood is like uh, you are working on a wonderfully great domain and that is the need of the hour in our country, ma'am. But yes, changing mindset takes time. It cannot be overnight done. Uh, arranging funding for... Uh, uh, education, research and development in country like India, where uh, government has to take care of so many millions and billions of uh, people who are, you know, some many of them below poverty line. So arranging funding for such things is another challenge. And uh, also bringing different stakeholders in which there are state governments and there are uh, central governments, there are non-government bodies. So bringing everybody on uh, board and getting the things done. So it is a Herculean task and I, I can understand. And uh, the, I know that this is a very challenging task, ma'am, and you are uh, doing it. So I, I wish you all the very best, ma'am, in this your initiative, a noble uh, initiative which you have taken. And I also thank you once again for uh, sparing your precious time, uh, Shipra, ma'am, and uh, Dr. Amrita for uh, uh, this particular interaction. Thank you a lot, ma'am, and all the very best. Yeah, so just one, um, give me one thing. So uh, going back to the uh, air pollution pilot, we really uh, love uh, the fact if you could you know also cover part of it once initiated i will uh, let you know of, uh, mm -hmm. as and when it will be initiated and if you if it can be reached out to all your sub subscribers that will be wonderful sure. always there man. always you know, you, always available yeah. i'm always so, available Thank I will you. share the details with you as and when they are available. Sure. Okay. Thanks a lot, ma'am.